Hey, 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 it is BQ here. Welcome back to the channel, The Impact Lounge. Been a few days since I've uh, talked with you guys since uh, since Rebellion, right? Um, it's been a few days. Just to reiterate some things I've been telling you guys lately. Um, last week at work, I worked 20 hours overtime. This week, I'm working 28 overtime. So um, I'm doing my best to get you guys content. It's oftentimes going to come from my car. I slept two hours today and I'm back at work, so uh, things are a little crazy for me right now. The cool factor is gonna take some hits because of it. I might be able to knock one out with TW this weekend, um, so we'll see. So uh, let's talk the news that came out today. Dave Meltzer had put out that Rebellion, we already knew Rebellion was was successful, or gonna, gonna be successful, we we felt that much. We knew Slammiversary was good, uh, was successful, and we knew Hard to Kill was successful. And now we've got Rebellion, which uh, Meltzer said, at first his initial tweet said it was the eighth uh, highest selling pay-per-view, wrestling pay-per-view since August of last year. And then he repeated, uh, he corrected himself, excuse me, and said it was um, <clears throat> the fourth highest. And it did nine times the buy of Bound for Glory, which doesn't shock me at all because, um, <clears throat> excuse me guys, I'm also sick, so I'm sorry doesn't shock me because Bound for Glory usually has a, a, a much lazier build and lazier card than the, uh, if that word offends you, I'm sorry, but let, let's be real, compared to the, the Slammiversaries and the pay-per-views they put on the first half of the year. That's just the way it is. So um, that doesn't shock me at all. Now, what are those numbers? We don't really know. I know during like the peak of TNA, <laughs> the pay-per-views were always kind of low, but I, I know they used to always be like the eight, 9,000 range, something like that. I wouldn't be surprised if they weren't in, typically in that ballpark still. We don't really know, but it's really good news, and it is a reflection that people are tuning in Impact, you know, new people. It's a reflection that if Impact is doing something meaningful and important and interesting, people are going to tune in, you know? Um, the debate comes up quite a bit about viewership, how much live viewership matters with the, the television program during the week. And, uh, you know, I see it in the comments on the channel a lot. There's people, like, oh, you know, the numbers aren't going up, see it on social media. And, and to reiterate something I've said before, if people who are, like, pre predominantly watching AEW and WWE and stuff like that haven't watched Impact in years, and now they're kind of like, okay, I have some interest in Impact, uh, them not tuning in live doesn't necessarily mean they're not interested in the show. And like I always tell you guys, I don't watch wrestling live ever. Does that make me less of a viewer than someone who watches live? I mean, or less of a fan? Like, I'm still watching the product. You know what I mean? We fall so much in love with those oh, the, those live viewers. But here's the thing, too. Let's just say me, for instance, if I decided I'm going to start watching Monday Night Raw. That's I haven't watched Monday Night Raw in five years. So that's a change to my personal routine. You know what I mean? So... If someone's like, hey, I'm going to start checking out Impact, who knows what the hell they got going on that night? You know what I mean? I always say live viewership is, it's, you know, okay, for me as a live viewer, a wrestling viewer, it isn't a reflection of the product. It's a reflection of my personal life if I'm watching that show as it airs. You, you know what I mean? There's so much that we don't take into consideration. But there's no doubt in my eyes there's more, I mean, more, no doubt in my mind there's more eyes on a product, uh, which is really cool. So... But speaking of Rebellion, uh, the next video I get into with you guys, we're going to talk about who can beat Kenny Omega. And I've had some some dialogue uh, with a contact at Impact, and uh, I, I feel like I got a better grasp on this storyline a little bit. So what I do is I read between the lines, because I don't get like that straight up like, here, this is what we're doing. I try to read between the lines. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to talk to you guys about that, um, but who can beat Kenny Omega, and Getting, get, getting you guys to understand my man Rich Swan, <clears throat> Rich Swan's involvement in the story. Because a lot of people are like, well, why, why is he the one wrestling Kenny Omega? You know what I mean? So uh, we're going to get into that a little bit. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about real quick, W. Morrissey has signed. Seems like it's a multi-year deal with Impact Wrestling. I don't like the W. Morrissey name a whole lot. I mean, it's his name, so he does what he wants. I don't know like the whole. I like that whole initial thing, but... Um, I think that's his real name, so uh, he's more than willing to do that. But I thought he looked excellent at Rebellion. He was the best part of that match. It was a match that I wasn't really interested in, to be you know as it was as it was laid out. Uh, he was the best part of the match. 
he towered Joe Doring, so it's crazy how big this dude uh, really is. I know on WWE television, he always say I'm seven foot tall. I believe he's like six eight or six nine, really. Uh, I heard him say that in interview that that's a shoot height, something somewhere in that ballpark. So I think he's a good addition. I'm really surprised they didn't bring him on sooner. I always thought him and Enzo, as a matter of fact, were were destined to be a part of Impact. So I don't know if. Uh, that the Enzo side of things is going to happen, but I, ex I expect big things. And we talk a lot about fresh faces and fresh talent and young talent. Well, the young talent is probably not a priority for Impact. I just don't think it is with their signings. It's but they, you know, at least we're getting fresh faces. A lot of the times, it's people from other companies that already have some kind of, you know, they're established. They're looking for opportunity. They're looking to reinvent themselves. I think that's just kind of what Impact provides for people: an opportunity to reinvent themselves. And, and get that second run, you know what I mean? EC3 is always going to be the, the best example of that. And I think they're more trying to find the next EC3 than the next, you know, young AJ or, or young Samoa Joe, you know what I mean? So uh, that's what i got for you guys right now. Thanks for tuning in. Again, uh, keep your eye out. We're going to talk about who can beat Kenny Omega for the Impact Wrestling title. And if, you, if you've, if you you know, if you've got to the point, oh, screw Impact and da-da-da, I was pissed too. I was mad. Um... When Rich Swan took that pin, I slammed my hand on the table next to me. I was, I was pissed. I've had some time to breathe, to think about it, and uh, don't write the company off here because the the thing is, there's a long-term story here that just doesn't happen in wrestling anymore. And we're a society that wants like the now, 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 or for us, long-term storyline is like three months or four months. You know what I mean? There's just a bigger picture here, so we got to go along for the ride before we before we judge it. That's what I got for you guys. I'm BQ. I'm out. Peace.